We got a Lions free agent signee coming back, and Trevor Sikama joins us. You are Locked On Lions, your daily Detroit Lions podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And it is, everybody, a Tuesday edition of Locked On Lions right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Matt Derry and you on a Tuesday, March the 5th and a Wednesday, March the 6th. We appreciate you listening and watching wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen each and every day right here on Locked On Lions. Love our Lions fans. Love our everydayers who are out there checking us out each and every day, whether it's on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, and, of course, on our Locked On Lions YouTube channel. Coming up on the program today from Pro Football Focus, Trevor Sikama. His thing is the draft. He was at the Combine. He was there all five days. Uh, you know, he, he he got that overrated shrimp cocktail down in Indianapolis. He did it all. We will talk to him coming up momentarily right here on Lockdown Lions. He should have gone to Shapiro's Deli, by the way. Uh, Lockdown Lions today brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. Before we get to Trevor Sick, I'm going to talk about the draft, talk about free agency, some news and notes uh, uh, from today. All right, first and foremost, we know this. The Lions need cornerbacks, right? Cam Sutton's coming back. Brian Branch is coming back. The rest, who knows? The Lions signed a guy by the name of by the name of Emmanuel Mosley last year, ex of the Niners, after he's tore, after he tore his ACL, gave him a one year deal around four or five million dollars. And what happens? Mosley rehabs, comes back in, early, in the early part of the season. I think it was September, or October. He tears his other ACL, like one snap in. It was terrible. Today, according to reports, the Lions are bringing back the former Niners cornerback and former Lion on a one year deal. <coughs> giving Mosley an opportunity to rehab and give him another shot. Love this move. Love the fact that he stuck around Detroit, rehabbed here, was with his teammates. Hopefully, if he's healthy, he will be a nice upgrade for this secondary. So, scratch off at least another cornerback coming back in Emmanuel Mosley that will be a part of the rotation. Now, there's another cornerback that uh, I think is going to be a home run for this team that I think the Lions are going to go get. And that is Darius Williams, ex of the Jaguars. Williams is a little bit older. He's 31. But think about this for a second. The amount of connections that this guy has with the Lions is unbelievable. First and foremost, Darius Williams uh, it, it was going into the last year of his deal with the Jags, three-year contract. Uh, they're releasing him to get his money off the books and to save some money in cap space. Last year, 19 PBUs, that's pass breakups, four interceptions. Savvy veteran, good size, uh, uh, you know, knows how to play. And think about this. He's coming from Jacksonville, who was his cornerbacks coach last year. None other than Deshae Townsend, the new secondary coach for the Lions. Where did Darius Williams play before he got his three-year deal with Jacksonville? That would be with the Rams. It was on their Super Bowl team uh, the, the first time around a couple of years ago. Has connections to Brad Holmes and Ray Agnew who are both with the Rams. So Darius Williams, that's D-A-R-I-O-S, Williams, I think is probably going to be the perfect signee for Detroit. Veteran corner, knows how to play, won't be too expensive, knows the system, knows Ray Agnew, knows Brad Holmes, knows Deshae Townsend, um, and gets released today by Jacksonville. So keep an eye on Darius Williams being a fit in Detroit. You got to figure the Lions are going to add him or somebody of that ilk to this team. Now, many of you have hit me up today with the big news. Yes, former Lion legend and Pro Bowl safety Quandre Diggs also being released today by Seattle for, uh, you know, to clear cap space. Cap casualty was a Jamal Adams in Seattle and Quandre Diggs. Quandre is in his 30s, but man, he can still play. I love Quandre Diggs. Who doesn't love Nino Quandre Diggs? Uh, here's my question, though. 
all these Lions fans, and some of you have hit me up on Twitter at Dairy Speaks or at Locked on Lions, Matt Dairy Facebook fan page. You want Quandre Diggs back? Where's he going to play? It was tough enough last year to try to get enough reps for C.J. Gardner-Johnson, who, by the way, is rumored to be going back to Philly. Um, Ify Melifonwu is really starting to come on, and Kirby Joseph. If next year you've got Mosley, Branch, Sutton, whoever the Lions drafted corner, you got to figure they're going to take one at some point. Um, maybe another signee, Joseph, Melifonwu. You know, like I mentioned, Brian Branch, that, that's that's a log jam. Quandre Diggs is going to sign somewhere where he immediately starts. On this team, I don't think the Lions have a safety issue. I think a guy like Kirby Joseph can play and maybe didn't have a, 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 as good a year as he had his first year, but still a really good football player. And if you had to, Melifonu, has got to be on the field. And I love the role that they had him in playing that, that strong safety spot. So... While I would love a reunion with former Lion Quandre Diggs, where are you going to play him? I'm not sure I see that, see that fit. All right, when we come back, Trevor Sikama from Pro Football Focus is going to recap the Combine for us. We will do that coming up next right here on a Tuesday edition of L.O. Lions. And Locked on Lions today is sponsored by BetterHelp. You've benefited from therapy in the past, but maybe, you know, you've given it up and you you didn't like your therapist or just things didn't work out, but you're thinking about talking to somebody again. How about this? Do it again with better help. All right. A lot of us spend our times or our lives wishing we had more time. But the question is, what do you have time for? Is it if time was unlimited, how would you use it? All right. The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it, all right? I see a therapist once every two weeks. It helps me stay grounded, talk to somebody neutral. Thinking about starting up therapy, you got to give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. All right, as promised, folks, let's go to our friends at Pro Football Focus, the man that I think is the best when it comes to the draft and kind of dissecting everything that these teams are looking for and the prospects. Trevor Sikama from PFF is our guest today, fresh off of a five- or six-day jaunt to uh, Indianapolis. Trev, what's up, buddy? Ooh, man, the body's recovering still from Indianapolis. I will say, though, you know, Indy was very nice to us this year with the weather. Normally, it is bitter cold, and we actually got two days in the high 60s, low 70s. And then it got very, very cold. But, I, you know, I'll give give Indianapolis its credit for the two days. It was a little bit warm. (laughs) Did you do the whole overrated shrimp cocktail at St. Elmo's? Did you find another couple of spots? Give me a... Give me the rundown. Of course. Yeah, no. Uh, shrimp cocktail at St. Elmo's. I feel like it's a yearly tradition. If you go for the combine, you at least got to go there once. Um, I So, yes, we, fortunately enough, PFF actually has a, a big company party that they normally do at St. Elmo's one of the nights. So I have a built-in shrimp cocktail event okay. that I get to have every single year, which is very, <laughs> very nice. But it was kind of funny. You know, so I'm bopping around Radio Row a little bit. I'm doing some different show appearances. And um, I think it was... I think it was the people at Harry and Izzy's, which is right next to where St. Yeah. Elmo's is. They're owned by the same people. Right. So, so they're walking around with the shrimp cocktail and I'm doing a show. I'm, I'm live on a show for, for the New York Jets. And it's not even like a pre-record. Like we're, we're, we're literally streaming live. And the woman comes up behind us with the shrimp cocktail. And we're like, we're kind of doing a show here. And she yeah. was like, nah, just take it on the show. We're like, okay, fine. So I'm mid show shoveling down a, uh, a, a shrimp cocktail with a heaping amount of horseradish. Let me oh, tell you. Hot. So oh, yeah. my, my, my reaction was, uh, as you would expect <laughs> live on their show. All right. So tell me about the combine. What, you know, you're, you're going to the airport or you're hopping in your car, whatever it is, what comes to mind? What's the first thing, what's your f- biggest takeaway from what you saw? Man, I just, I always love the interviews with these guys. It's my favorite part of the process because we all can watch the tape and the tape is the most important part of it. But 
when we talk about, oh, this is a guy's floor or this is his ceiling, yes, athletic ability and just overall football ability goes into that. But really the biggest piece of that pie is who the players are, you know, who they are underneath the helmet, between the ears, if you will, in the in their chest and their heart. When you have a high desire to be a great football player, that raises your floor, even if maybe you aren't as physically gifted as some other players in the class. And I think the same can be said about ceiling, right? When we talk about these guys that, oh, you know, his potential is through the roof. Well, we see the talent there. The talent is there. But when we talk about potential, we talk about them wanting it, the work ethic, the desire. You know, we saw this from Puka Nakua last year. You know, he goes on from being a late day three pick to breaking the rookie wide receiver receiving yard record. And that's just simply because of, yes, he is a talented player, but everybody's talented at the NFL level. It's it's who you are. It's what makes him tick. It's what drives him. And so, you know, getting to sit there and talk to guys like, like Sion Vaki and Darius Robinson and Marshawn Nealon, like all, all these kinds of different players, you just kind of get a very brief glimpse at their podium sessions into who they are as people. And, and again, like what makes them go, what their drive is like. And uh, you know that that's the reason why NFL teams are there as well. You just mentioned three guys the Lions talk to. <laughs> I swear. Well, two, two of them I did. Two of them I did on purpose. The other one I didn't know. So how about that? That's pretty impressive. Um, I, I want to get to all the Lions stuff in a second. But uh, what did you think of how Caleb, Caleb Williams responded to that complete idiot reporter that starts screaming out that stuff right at the beginning. I thought that was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's, it, it, it was a tough worded question and I was kind of reading his responses on Twitter and he said, Hey, I was trying to get Caleb Williams attention. I was trying to kind of put him in an uncomfortable spot. Unfortunately, that's still, it just kind of didn't come out right, but I thought cable Caleb handled it fine. I mean, I think that he was, he was ready for it. Right. I mean, it's not like he got up to the podium and thought, Oh, Nobody's going to ask me about not doing anything at the combine. He was well prepared for it. Um, and I really did. I was at his podium session for the entire, whatever it was, was 13, 14, 15 minutes that he was up there. And uh, I thought he handled things very well. You know, he is somebody who has the potential to have some tough questions come out, you know, whether it was that first one or, or, or any others, just because of him being a quarterback, you know, him being more outgoing, you know, some of the things that he's done over the last couple of years, his play style, you know, people talking about him about generational. Anytime you had, you throw that word out there, people are going to look to, uh, you know, find these holes in his game and criticize him one way or the other. And so Caleb's got a lot of pressure on his shoulders and I really did. It, it's just a 15 minute period of time, but I thought he handled it. Well, I, I was, I was still impressed with what he was able to say when he was up there. Trevor Sigma with us from Pro Football Focus. Is, was there somebody that didn't do well that you walked away from the podium and went, man, he's a jerk, or man, he didn't do well, or he was nervous, or, geez, I hope the teams didn't see that, or was everybody pretty good? You know, I don't know if I ran into anybody this year that was like that. I, man, I, I remember in years past, the one that sticks out to me is, is Ja'Kai Polite when he was coming through his NFL draft journey, and he got up to the podium, and it was as if, like, no one had prepped him for anything yeah, like yeah. podium questions, team questions, because people started asking him about team questions. Cause he's, he started kind of giving a little bit of some, some strange answers to be like, well, hold on. Well, what do you mean? Like, what, what did this team do? And he was just, he was like, oh yeah, the team like came in and they were like bashing me, you know, like they were telling <laughs> me all about my bad film and all that. And it's like, whoa. And so people continue to ask him questions and you could very quickly figure out that no one prepped him or at least it didn't register in his head that there was going to be this pushback from teams and how to handle it and how to handle questions and things like that. So that is one that just really stands out to me. And obviously he went a lot further down in the draft than we thought probably because of that. And you know, he didn't really last in the NFL because of that. And um, he was a super talented player. So I, I was nothing like that this year. Thankfully, okay. you know, I'm, I'm thankful that, uh, that the guys were pretty well prepared this year. So a week from yesterday, uh, we got free agency hitting where we're going to start seeing reports of, all right, agreeing to terms and all of that. How do you view what Detroit is going to do? Obviously they've, 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 they've openly said, we want to keep our good players. So, you know, do they re-sign Jonah Jackson? Is he going to be too expensive? Graham Glasgow, guys like that. And then as they look into the market, you know, do you think they'll try to get splashy and, and go get Christian Wilkins or Matt Abike or somebody like that? Um, how do you view how the Lions do free agency? And then obviously that would affect their draft. Yeah, I think they'll make a run for some of those guys, certainly if the finances make sense, right? They're in a winning window and they realize it. You know, they've been steadily getting to 
that point where you and I just talked a couple of weeks ago, like you're just, you got to be so impressed with where this team is right now. And with Ben Johnson coming back again, you got to, you you got to say to yourself, like we're in a very, very special situation because around the league, basically every other team, when you have a good year, whether you win the Super Bowl or not, your good coordinators are getting poached. Your good position coaches are getting poached. Like everybody's trying to upgrade somewhere. And so for the Lions to retain a lot of that, specifically with what Ben Johnson has done on the offensive side of the ball, I think they do. I think that, that Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes got to kind of look each other in the eye and say, like, let, let's do it. Let, like, let's get as close to the cap floor or even, you know, manipulate things a little bit here and there to get some really good players on this team. So to me, what I'm looking for, what I'm watching closely for the Lions when it comes to retaining their own guys is that offensive line, right? You mentioned those two guys in Glasgow and, and Jackson there because if they end up losing one or both of those players, then all of a sudden a lot of the mock drafts that we do at the back end of the first round, we're talking a lot about defensive line. We're talking a lot about corner for them, but they'll probably firmly have – uh interior offensive line then on the table because it could be a sweet spot to get one of those really talented players. So that's what I'm watching the most. And then, yeah, just any sort of splash that they make. I think interior defensive line, you mentioned a couple of guys there in Matabike and, and, and Christian Wilkins, you know, guys like that who would be great for them. Because again, if you sign one of those players, it really frees you up to say, wow, okay, now we've got this major playmaker. You know, we've, we, we've got Aline McNeil. We've got Aiden Hutchinson. We've got some other role players in there. If we get one more key piece, a back end of the first round type of defensive line presence, probably an edge rusher at that point, they're probably thinking to themselves, we're close to complete, right? We, yeah. We've got the best recipe in the salary cap era, right? In the salary cap situation, we've got about as good of a, a team as you could ask for. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for what they do along the interior offensive line, of course, interior defensive line as well, because I think that's going to have a major impact on who they draft at uh, the back end of the first round. There were a lot of silly rumors yesterday about Legereus need to Detroit and Jamison Williams would go to Kansas City. I don't see that happening. They're not giving up on JMO. But what would do you think a Sneed deal to Detroit look like if if they're having conversations? Yeah, man, that I, I hadn't seen the JMO element of it. I can't imagine that they get rid no. of Jameson Williams. He's he yeah. I, I think that they, they've spoken too highly of him and kind of how he is acclimated to the NFL level. I know it wasn't as uh hit the ground running as some people maybe wanted it to be, but I think that he is gonna have a phenomenal year this upcoming year in the, that offense. I really do. So I don't think they're moving on from him, but yeah, Sneed's in an interesting spot because you know, Kansas City tags him, so you're playing under the tag. If you trade for him, then obviously you've got to be under the impression that you're trading for him then to get a long-term deal done for him. So yeah. that's that's always the trickiest part with these situations is it's not just the high draft compensation. It's also the dollar amounts. It's also the salary cap space that you're going to have to allocate here. So Sneed is still good enough to where I think, especially with a back end of the first round pick, you're probably dealing a first round pick for him, even knowing that you have to resign him. Now you could probably get creative and say, all right, we'll give you, you know, a two this year, a two next year, maybe sprinkle in some other picks and perhaps Kansas city will go for it. But you know, the, the, the problem with the bidding war for a guy like Snead's services, which I, let me be clear, he'd be fantastic in Detroit. There, there's oh, yeah. a reason why we're talking about him here. And I think that he'd be a great addition, but the issue is, Kansas City is also going for their three P, right? They're not going to just move on from him to move on from him. You know, some teams maybe in similar situations, if they've got a couple of big guys assigned, you know, maybe you tag guys and you're you're in a little bit more of a negotiating standpoint. Like I think Cincinnati might be in this situation with T. Higgins, right? You tag him, but yeah, okay, Cincinnati's in a winning window, but they're still also thinking about how to stay healthy, how to extend their success, all that kinds of stuff. For Kansas City, you know, Travis Kelsey might retire after this year. Andy Reid might retire after this year. You know, they're getting to the point where oh, their, their offensive coordinators and defensive coordinator have basically remained untouched. I can't think that that happens after another successful season upcoming. So this is it for them. So it, it, that all builds into the price for Snead because they'll say, okay, this is our price to get rid of him, which I think starts at a first round pick. And they don't really have a reason to budge. If some team gives them a first round pick for Snead, okay, that's fine. They got McDuffie who could stand, who can step in um, and, and really continue to elevate his play as he has done the last couple of years. But that's what makes it tough for Detroit. I think if they would want Legereus Snead, it would probably be at least that back end of the first round pick. 
maybe something else, maybe that gets it done, but still that's a high price for a team like that, that uh, we know Brad Holmes likes to build through the draft. Let's run through some players with Trevor Sikama, some, certainly some corners, D tackles, offensive linemen that maybe the lions could be eyeing and have talked to. We'll do that coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And right now you can go and shoot your shot with Locked On's official sports betting partners over at FanDuel with the NBA season underway. Right now, new customers will get $150 in bonus bets by simply winning any $5 bet. Doesn't matter if the odds are overwhelmingly in your favor. If with your first bet, you put $5 down and win, that's 150 bucks your way just for winning that $5 bet. Yeah, it's like 30 to 1 odds. It's awesome. So you can put that in on a bunch of stuff with the NBA. You also check out NFL draft odds as well. Who's going to be the number one overall pick, the number two overall selection, all of that. You can check all that out. Plus quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and much more. So head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started today. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, our man Trevor Sikama with us, uh, fresh off of the Combine. He was there live and in person uh, down in Indianapolis. Right, there were five guys. The Lions talked to a bunch of people, all right? but the, And we don't have the names of all of them. But various reports come in, guys confirmed it. Giving you five names, and I, I want you to tell me who stands out. These were ones that I just thought, oh, man, if they're in, the, in a Lion uniform, I love them. Mm -hmm. Johnny Newton, Darius Robinson, Kool-Aid, Xavier Leggett, and Marshawn Nealand, who stands out for you, uh, that group? And I know if Newton somehow is at 29, like I would sprint the card up to the to the commissioner, right? Yeah, that's that's the one that stands out to me. Obviously, like Newton, we, we talked in the previous segment about interior defensive linemen, Christian Wilkins, Justin Matabike. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not able to get one of those high profile interior defensive linemen and Johnny Newton is even within striking distance, honestly, if you could trade up a little bit for him, I think that he would be perfect. It, it, I think that he is really getting overlooked in this class. I, I think the distance between him and Byron Murphy, the second of Texas is a lot closer than people are, are willing to admit. These guys are fantastic. If you look at Newton's cumulative PFF grades over the last two years, elite run defense grade, elite pass rushing grade. I don't get much better than that for an interior defensive <laughs> lineman, right? So I think that he'd be fantastic. Darius Robinson is somebody who also stands out to me because when I was at his podium, I talked about how much I think that you can gain from getting to know players and, when the media is at the podium, it's not very personable, right? I mean, there's 20, 25 people around, especially for the big name players, sometimes a lot more for those high profile guys. But with Darius, it, guys are coached to give good answers. You know, like when they talk about, oh, you know, what position do you want to play at the NFL? They say like, oh, you know, I, I can play any position, blah, blah, blah. But, but the way that Darius Robinson, who is a versatile defensive lineman from Missouri, the way that he answered that question, you could just tell that there is enthusiasm in his voice when he says, I'll play anything. I play nose. I play five tech. I'll play four. Eye, I'll play three. I'll play wide nine. He's like, I'll play anything. And then he said, just give me a pair of cleats. Let me put my cleats in the ground and let me play football. And it's like, okay, that stands out to me like that. Like I genuinely believe. And sounds he said, like it with, sounds like a Detroit lion. And he said it with the <laughs> biggest smile on his face too. And, and I recorded part of it. Um, he talked about keeping it simple, keeping it violent, keeping it fast. That's how he likes to play defensive line. And I, 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 I remember I tweeted that out and right below it, I responded to that tweet and I said, Darius Robinson, you are a Detroit lion. Cause I genuinely yeah. believe that if he is on the board at 29, he's going to be very high on there for him. I think the same with Marshawn Nealon. They play a similar brand of football. Those are the three that uh, that really stand out to me the most when it comes to uh, guys that are going to have their targets. What do you think of Leggett? Could he be a second round receiver for Brad Holmes? Yeah, I think that Leggett is probably in that late second, early third round range. It really wasn't much of a NFL draft prospect at all going into this season. Played very sparingly for South Carolina over the last three or four years as a big special teams guy, high effort guy, but just really was not involved in their passing attack much. Their number one receiver, Juice Wells, he suffered uh, a foot injury that kind of had him in and out of the lineup to start the year, and then he clearly just was not going to come back this season. All of a sudden, it was Xavier Leggett and nobody else, and they kind of force-fed him the ball in the passing game, and he absolutely rewarded him. So, Look, he's a contested catch type of a alpha receiver, but 
He's not as big as you would think. South Carolina listed him as six foot three. He's only about six foot one. He is still higher in weight. We weighed in about 221. So that kind of is, is um, similar to what we saw on his bio, but a little bit shorter arms, a little bit smaller of hands. We thought he was going to be more of this just like big, hulking, imposing force. But still, we saw at his combine tests, uh, the vertical jump, the 40 yard dash, the broad jump, just the explosiveness that this guy has. I, I think that uh, you're, you're not really dropping him any further than that. So I think back into the second round, early part of the third round is definitely in range for the Lions. Trevor, what about cornerbacks? Who who slides to 29? Who could realistically be there? Obviously, Arnold won't be there. I'm hoping DeGene somehow slides. I don't think that's happening. But who, who could be a realistic corner at 29? Yeah, if DeGene were to be there at the back end of the first round, he's absolutely up there with Johnny Newton as maybe this like sprint it into the podium and, yeah. and get this player in because he's perfect. I mean, when I was getting some of my nuggets from um, – Detroit reporters about kind of what they've heard and everything. It just, it, it seems like it's a lot of the same themes that we've heard about the Lions over the years. You got to be physical. You got to be willing to tackle. You got to be tough, you know, like all this kinds of stuff. These are the words that come to their, their, their mouths, whether it's the coaches or the GM or whatever. And so I think the gene fills all of that really, really well. Cooley McKintree is somebody who I like scheme wise for this team. You know, you play man coverage, you got a ton of coverage in, uh, he's got a ton of experience, excuse me, in man coverage. And so that you absolutely like, are they going to believe that with him being a little bit lighter of a weight, do they think that he can tackle as well as, as they really want their corners to do? I think that's kind of a little bit of a debate there. I I like Ennis Rakestraw Jr. from Missouri. This is somebody who's not afraid to come up and tackle. Absolutely not. It's cut in fact, like a calling card of his game. But when I watched him, they play him a lot of off coverage, and I wondered if it's because he just didn't necessarily have the long speed and the recovery speed that some of these other corners do, and then he didn't test great. And, and so when you are not an elite athlete at the cornerback position, that's just something you think about. I, I don't think those guys very often go in the first round, but he is a Detroit Lion type, right? I think that if you end up going with defensive line, in the first round, the back end of the first round, Rick Shaw Jr., I think, all becomes a target for them then somewhere on day two. I think mm. the same can be said about, like, Kalen Car Carson from uh, from Wake Forest, although he's not going to be a first or second round guy. I think he's more of a third, fourth round type of a player, but he's somebody who loves to come up and tackle, loves to be physical, um, just a fiery competitor in that regard. So that's how I see the corners and, and where Detroit could be gravitating towards. All right, so let's say, like you said, Jonah Jackson maybe leaves, and it's it's time to move. You got to get a left guard in there. I know they talked to the kid from BYU, uh, Panisul's cousin. I don't know; he's a tackle, but but you know, BB is a possibility at twenty nine. Who who else maybe late first could be a Detroit Lion type that you plug and play on the interior of the offensive line? Yeah, I think you know, Jax Powers Johnson is the dream, but I don't think he makes it there. Um, I think there's a couple of of tackles who could like kick inside where I, again, I think Detroit Fontano from um, Fontano, I believe is how you say his last name from Washington. I think that he is going to be gone, but I think Jordan Morgan could be a possibility for them. He played, uh, he played left tackle for Arizona. I don't think he has the arm length to play offensive tackle. So he's likely a convert to guard. So I think that he is somebody who kind of comes to mind. Graham Barton as well. The left tackle from Duke, who I think is, likely going to play guard or center at the NFL level. I think that he is somebody who could make that transition. Uh, I think, the, I, I don't know if there's anybody else that's going to be considered at the back end of the first round outside of those guys, but then you get into the second round, you got guys like Christian Haynes from UConn, Kieran Amagaji from, from Yale. Uh, you've got some really, really solid interior offensive line players who maybe aren't those first round names, but again, if you go a different direction, if you go corner, if you go into your defensive line at the back end of the first round, some of these other players could be available for you as you get a little bit further down the draft. Dominic Pooney from uh, Kansas, another one who is a tackle for them, but he also played left guard. I think he'll play guard at the NFL level. So there's a lot of depth with the interior offensive line class, and I feel as though the back end of that second round is kind of a sweet spot to maybe get yourself a starter in this class. Locked On Podcast Network alum and legend. We love him. Trevor Sikama from PFF. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it, Matt. Trevor Sigma with us here on a Tuesday edition of Locked On Lions talking everything, everything when it comes to the combine.